So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled 20th Century Fiction. This is the introductory video. Uh, my name is Abhishek Pari. I teach English and Culture Studies at IIT Madras. So in this very short video, I'll give you an outline of the course, essentially give you the flavor of the course and describe the content in terms of the text that will be covering on this course and also the uh, range of expectations that you may have from the course and what are my expectations as a resource person uh, from this particular course. So at the very outset, uh, 20th century fiction, we need to be aware of the historical location of this particular course. Uh, in the sense that this is, uh, uh, you know, this caters to texts which are written in early 20th century, uh, although we have texts which are written in 1899 and it goes down right after the Second World War. So essentially, the historical time period in which this, uh, these series of texts are located uh, before and after the Second World War. So before the First World War, First World War and then Second World War. So two world wars play a very important role in this course as uh, do other cultural contexts in which I will talk about in a bit. So at the very outset, let me take you uh, to the text that we covered in this course. So we have, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the Postmaster by Ramindranath Tagore, which is a very short story, uh, which is also a very interesting reflection of the colonial Bengal and uh, as said in that story and also a very interesting relationship, a human relationship between a colonial employee, uh, the postmaster and a rural uh, girl and how that uh, a relationship of empathy is reflected with the political and cultural conditions of Bengal at that time. Uh, then you move on to one of the cult texts in modernity and uh, literary modernism and that is Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad uh, which is historically written in 1899 but it is one of those texts which really is an entry point uh, into cultural modernity. I mean, no study of modernism, for instance, is, uh, is complete without Conrad, especially Heart of Darkness. And we also see how this text, Heart of Darkness, is quite resonant with some of these geopolitical tensions and conditions that we, in the world we live in today. So in terms of guilt, in terms of imperialism, uh, in terms of the entire ambivalence around uh, an enterprise of imperialism and how it tries to whitewash itself as a civilized mission, as a religious mission, while also being nakedly uh, uh, mercantile and, and profit-making and how this entire ambivalence is depicted in a very human way uh, through a very unreliable and neurotic narrator uh, in Heart of Darkness, which is a story that will do uh, by Joseph Conrad. Then we move on to some poetry. We'll have proof work and other observations by T.S. Eliot. Uh, again, a very interesting, uh, albeit a bleak depiction of modernity, especially metropolitan modernity. It talks about a city, the metropolis, the mundane metropolis, and how that consumes the entire automatism of the metropolis. Uh, has a slightly cannibalistic quality in a way it consumes human movements, and how um, it sort of blurs away the relationship between the organic and the inorganic. How human beings become more automatic, and machines become more humanized, and that blurring borderline becomes obviously part of the existential and political crisis and how that all gets reflected in the lyric uh, of Eliot. Uh, so we look at the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock and also a couple of other poems from the same collection. And then we move on to Eliot's, uh, I know, uh, the major work of Eliot, the most major work, the work that is most famous for, which is The Wasteland, written in 1922, uh, which is essentially again about the fractured fault lines of cultural modernity, uh, about how the European civilization is, sort of comes to an end, reaches its crisis point, and also very much uh, text about the First World War. So we'll see how the World War becomes a very interesting spectral presence around all these texts. And the spectrality of the war becomes a very important factor for us. And we should always factor in uh, you know, any reading of modernism, any reading of 20th century literature, especially early 20th century literature, must factor in uh, the spectral presence or the hauntological presence of the war as it were. So the Wasteland will be read as a text which is about the crisis of civilization and also how that gets reflected uh, in the lyric and the anti-lyrical quality of Wasteland is something we'll be examining very, very closely. So we look at how, uh, again, uh, as an early 20th century modernity literature, uh, how that's depicting uh, the cultural crisis, communication crisis, civilizational crisis, and how there is a very interesting and authentic reflection of the crisis of modernity. So we find that it's actually a very depressing genre, if you think about it in one way. Uh, it's full of sad, depressing texts talking about bleak human existential conditions. But among the many things we'll do in this course, we'll look at the style of representation. We'll look at how uh, the manner of representation sometimes becomes more important than what gets represented. So the uh, how of representation becomes more important than the what of representation. In other words, the manner becomes more important than the matter sometimes. So the manner in which the crisis is communicated, the manner in which the civilizational uh, collapse is communicated in wasteland sometimes becomes more important than what is actually being said. And we'll continue in that uh, line of thinking, line of investigation, when we move on to the next text in this course, which is James Joyce's uh, collection of short stories, Dubliners, uh, a fantastic collection of short stories, which is again about this very bleak and gloomy Dublin 
of early 20th century and how the entire idea of religion is a repressive apparatus, uh, the very interesting relationship between human desire and the Catholic Church and how desire gets uh, repressed and sublimated and different kinds of discourses. We look at one particular story in particular uh, that is Araby by uh, Joyce and we look at how in that story the different linguistic registers uh, correspond to different existential positions. So when you have the position of alienation, the language changes. When you have the position of desire, the language changes. And also how desire is couched in religious rhetoric and how language becomes such a potent vehicle, a potent instrument of representation in terms of representing the mind. And that is a very key thing in modernism, as all of you would know uh, in some degree. The whole obsession with the mind, the whole obsession with consciousness and a stream of consciousness, epiphany. So the entire inward looking gaze of this kind of literature becomes a very important uh, point and also quite political in quality. Uh, you know, literature becomes very different from modernism. It becomes more about consciousness, about human uh, insight and epiphany. And you know, that's the reason why it, it's such an important fertile field to look at if you're doing research, let's say, on consciousness and literature, on thought processes and literature, and psychology and literature. So, you know, Dublin has become a very important entry point again in this kind of a research. Then you have Mrs. Dalloway uh, by uh, Virginia Woolf, which is essentially about a PTSD veteran. It's about the entire medicalization of crisis. It's about this very interesting relationship between medicine, literature, and war. It's very much a First World War text. It's perhaps the most direct uh, First World War text in this entire course. Uh, and like you mentioned, the war is never really away from modernism. So the entire discourse of the tree modernism has war as a very spectral presence. It's like Hamlet's father, which keeps coming back up in different disguises and different forms. So in Mrs. Dalloway, the war is very much a presence. We have a war veteran who comes back to London, who cannot integrate into the civilian space. An entire novel is about the lack of integration, rather the disintegration suffered existentially uh, by the war veteran, and how that is very cruelly medicalized uh, by the contemporary medical apparatus, which doesn't quite understand. It's about the lack of empathy as well. And how all this gets represented in very literary language. It's very interestingly inward-looking language. And this inwardness of language is something which will keep coming back and looking at uh, throughout this course. And then we have perhaps the greatest novel written in the history of English literature, Ulysses, uh, my personal favorite, uh, by James Joyce, which is essentially about one day in Dublin. I mean, it's just one calendar day, but it's a 500-page novel about one day, and the reason is it's not really about one day. It's about the different uh, moving back and across time uh, in the human minds. So different characters inhabit different timescapes in the mind, different psychological timescapes. Uh, they have streams of consciousness, they have epiphanies, they have thought processes, and all that gets represented is very hodgepodge narrative, which is Ulysses, which is also quite postmodern uh, in some respect. So we look at Ulysses, as we'll see in Ducos, it's modernist as well as a precursor of postmodernism. It's actually everything. It's a bazaar of literature. It does everything that a great work of literature should do. So that is the high point of modernism, 1922, in which Ulysses gets written. And we'll also look at something as focalization, how does a story get focalized for different characters. And Ulysses is really a masterpiece when it comes to the whole discourse of focalization. How does the same story get told to different focal perspectives? And that is something which we'll investigate in due course when we read Ulysses. Uh, moving on, we'll look at some short stories. For instance, Captain Mansfield's A Fly. Again, a direct story about the First World War, about the neurosis and trauma of the First World War. Again, the war doesn't really get mentioned directly, but it's very much there as some kind of a hauntological presence, as a spectral presence, like a furniture, it's like an old furniture which doesn't go away. It's very much there, and the war is a piece of furniture in the story, literally a piece of furniture in the story, and how the text of a haunted quality as the story progresses. It's a very short story, but extremely complex psychological narrative, which we'll see in due course. Then we have Solid Objects uh, by Virginia Woolf. Again, the war is a very spectral presence. It's about a very bizarre narrative, a slightly Kafkaesque in quality. It's about British politics, imperialism, museumization, and also about fetish formation. And again, it goes back to the whole idea of the human mind, the abnormalities, the obsessions of the human mind, and how that gets represented in literature and literary language. The last couple of stories are very interesting. They look at the entire discourse of modernity, of uh, modernist literature from an Indian perspective, like Tagore's story with which discourse opens. Uh, we have Toba Teik Singh, which is essentially the partition narrative, perhaps the greatest shots are written about partition by Sadat Hassan Manto. It's about memory, trauma, and the entire constructed quality about nation formation, which is something we see uh, parodied to a certain extent in Toba Teik Singh. And of course, we'll finish with the chess plays, uh, which takes us right back into the heart of imperialism, uh, when the Eastern companies is taking over the kingdoms uh, through a financial maneuver. Uh, it's, it's a very historical text. It's also about the decline of a certain feudal quality of life. 
and the arrival of a certain mercantile quality of life. So uh, I read uh, the chess players as an economic text. It's about a paradigm shift in economy when the feudal economy goes away and a capitalist economy comes into being. So even for people interested in economy, uh, the setting of Lucknow and how the paradigm shift happens economically in that story is a very interesting case in point. And of course, we have other issues as well, gender, masculinity, uh, the entire female condition and also the feudal condition, how it gets represented uh, in the story. So that being the range of texts which we'll cover in this course, as you may have guessed, it's a really rich and um, uh, diverse range. It moves on from European modernity to a very Catholic Dublin. It comes back to rural Bengal and then of course we have Belgium, Congo. Uh, it takes you across different locations at different points of time and it ends with Lucknow, uh, the pre sepai rebellion Lucknow. Uh, so we have different geopolitical locations uh, getting represented to different literary formations and literary representations, which is what makes this text uh, hopefully interesting uh, for the reader as well as a scholar. Now, uh, what are the takeaways from this course? Why are we interested in modernism at all? And why should we study modernism looking at it from 2019 or 20 in which the year in which this course will be floated? So this course essentially seeks to study uh, some of the key texts, as I mentioned, in late 19th century uh, and 20th century fiction and engage with some uh, issues, some political cultural issues. So what are these issues? Very broadly speaking, the issues would be, let's say, imperialism, cultural modernity, uh, First World War trauma. The First World War is very much there as a spectral presence. Uh, embodiment of technology, the relationship in the human body and how it consumes technology and in the process gets consumed by technology, agency, consumerism and identity. And all these become very fractured categories in modernism. And how does modernist literature become instrumental in terms of focalizing and foregrounding this fractured identity, this fractured state. So in a way, modernism and modernist literature is about the fracturedness the fault lines in belief, the fault lines in civilization, the fault lines in communication, and how does it keep foregrounding the fault lines? That becomes a very key instrument, a very key strategy, if you will, uh, about modernism and modern literature in general. Now, uh, through a very carefully selected uh, in a series of literary texts and the cultural context, this course aims to offer a very complex understanding of fiction, reality, and representation. Right? So the whole relationship in fiction and reality, because you know, if you look at fiction, it's not really a lie, it's not really a fantasy, it's a possibility. So fiction is always a production of possibilities. It combines historical reality with possibilities. In other words, it's about what did take place with what could have taken place and sometimes what should have taken place. So all these focal points are mixed together and we have this very messy entanglement which is fiction, which is not a lie, which is not a reality, but it's a liminal landscape between lie and reality. So this being the long and short of the course, let's talk about the pragmatic things about the course. So this will be a 12-week course constituting 30 hours uh, starting from January 2020. Uh, there'll be two sets of evaluations, one's a weekly analysis, which will be happening after every week. Uh, we'll have to appear for some weekly tests and then you have this one long major test at the end of it. Uh, and the credits will be commensurated according to the weekly and the uh, final test scheme. In terms of prerequisites, uh, a BA or an MA in English or culture will be helpful, although it's not really required. If you're interested in modernity, if you're interested in modernism or modernist literature, do feel free to enroll in this course. It'll be helpful for you, uh, hopefully. In terms of the takeaways from this course, what can you do from this course? If you're interested in research, MPhil, PhD, in cultural modernity, masculinity, gender, memory studies, uh, literature's relationship with technology, literature and neuroscience. So all these different aspects will be touched upon uh, as you move on in this course. And some of the stakes uh, are for a very fertile field. Uh, in terms of looking at his inquiries. So hopefully it'll be an interesting and enriching course for you. I look forward to uh, spending time with you uh, as the course progresses. So I welcome you again to 20th Century Fiction and I look forward to interacting with you in the times to come. Thank you for your attention.